welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. Joe, do you remember the discount window? Yeah. The only thing I know about the discount window is that it's some way for the banks to borrow money from the Fed and that they always talk about the stigma of the discount window. And I don't even really know why, but I know it's like the banks have various ways of pledging uh, collateral and borrowing, but something about the discount window. I doubt there's a real window, but maybe uh, there's a stigma attached to it, supposedly. (laughs) That's all I know about the entire thing. That's it. That's it. I'm I'm imagining banks like going up to a window at the Fed and being like, I'll have one billion worth of liquidity, please. Um, No. OK, so the discount window facility is an emergency lending facility from the Fed. And I, I think the one of the reasons there's a stigma attached to it is we tend to see usage of it go up during crises and most notably during the 2008 financial crisis. And during March of 2020, we saw discount window use go up as well. And interestingly, even though we are not experiencing a financial crisis at the moment, we have seen the discount window balances go up more recently. They reached $10 billion, I think, in late November. Uh, currently, they've come down a little bit around like $4 billion. But it is kind of weird to see this happening at a time when there are still supposedly ample reserves in the financial system and still a lot of liquidity sloshing around. Right. We have seen, you know, the markets sold off and all that. But by and large, like there's no like sort of signs that there's like some like real like stress in the financial system. And I don't I don't I don't as far as I know. But, you know, this is one of those things like for some reason, someone out there is using this facility. I don't think we know who, you know, the other thing I know about the discount window is like I I sort of associate like every once in a while you see like a zero hedge tweet about it or something like that. It's like, (laughs) oh, there's a little line that ticked up. So what does this mean? And then (laughs) the apocalypse is coming. Yeah, that's the other thing that I sort of associate with with uh, the discount window. But yeah, that is sort of this. It's an interesting question. Like what's going on there? Right. So it is a little bit of a mystery at the moment. There's some speculation that maybe it has to do with some losses in the crypto industry recently. We have seen Silvergate, for instance, under pressure, uh, some other banks potentially as well. Maybe some smaller banks that have experienced a lot of losses on their bond portfolios uh, as interest rates go up. There's all these theories floating around. So I thought we really need to stop and just talk generally about what the discount window is and how it came into being and what it means maybe that use is going up now. Maybe it tells us something more broad about where we're heading. You know, what's weird to me is you think like, okay, emergency borrowing, you have to pay a premium for that. But like discount window, I assume that's even cheaper money. So everything about it is a mystery to me. Totally. And if you think back to, you know, like one of the fundamental tenets of central banking is lend freely against good collateral. So why is it a big deal if banks are uh, using the discount window? The Fed has made it clear uh, in recent years that it it wants banks to use the discount window when it has to. But anyway, we could keep talking about this or we could bring on our (laughs) guest. Bring in an expert. Yeah, bring in an expert who really is the perfect person to discuss this. We're going to be speaking with Bill Nelson. He's executive vice president and chief economist at the Bank Policy Institute, which is a a trade group slash, slash think tank for banks. But previously, he spent 24 years at the Fed, including, I think, about a decade actually overseeing the discount window. The, so, the actual perfect guest. When you're, when you're just like, <laughs> yeah. okay, here's someone spending 10 years running the discount window. I think the actual perfect guest. Yeah, exactly. So, Bill, thank you so much for coming on All Thoughts. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I really enjoy your show. and it's, Thank it's, you. It's fantastic to be here. Oh, thank you so much. Maybe just to begin with, you know, should we should we start sounding the the zero hedge alarms? Is this like the, the beginning of a new financial crisis that discount use is going up? No, it actually just to 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 take you back a touch. It's not yeah. it's really not even the case that the discount window is generally an emergency lending facility. So hmm. when people think about the Fed lending, you know, of course they think about the the global financial crisis and lending to AIG and yeah. panics and and alphabet soups of facilities. Those are all emergency lending that's done uh, to non-banks. The discount window is something that's been there since the beginning of the Fed. It's a it's a vehicle for lending to depository institutions, so banks, thrifts, credit unions. It really was a window, and they really did 
oh, discount cool. thing. So the reason why it's called the discount window is not because the lent, the credit was extended at a, at a subsidized rate, although it was for 40 years, and that's kind of an interesting story in and of itself, yeah, we'll but I'll skip that. over that. Okay. But because the way the credit was extended was by discounting customer notes. Okay. So the bank would bring in a commercial loan uh, that maybe, let's say it paid off $1,000 in in a month, and, and the, the Fed would give them... Nine hundred and ninety dollars for it. Right. And then when the month was over, the Fed would get the thousand dollars as the repayment on the loan. So that that's where the name comes from. Related to the this this discussion we're having right now, the Fed yeah. has always had sort of a come hither, stay away approach to the discount window where <laughs> they want people to be willing to use it, but at the same time they don't want people to use it too much. So if you right. go back and uh, and we'll, I'm sure, talk more about stigma, but if you go back and look at uh, changes that the Fed has made to the window over time, they've kind of alternated between changes that were made to try to encourage people to borrow and changes that were made to discourage people from borrowing. So, And the, the most recent set of changes, yeah. and one that I was uh, very involved in, was in 2003. And in 2003, the Fed went from extending credit at a subsidized rate, which required a lot of rules, to uh, extending credit at an above market rate. And the idea was to get rid of all those rules and just let the rate itself mm. um, uh, determine how, how much credit people wanted. But they really wanted people to use it as a backup. Uh, so there's, there's actually three types of discount window credit. There's primary credit, a, a secondary credit, and seasonal credit. So just, and mm. these loans go on all the time. There's loans every day, in relatively small amounts, particularly seasonal credit. But it's a perfectly ordinary thing, although it is a tool that the Fed uses in response to a financial crisis too. So that's really interesting, this idea that it's like, okay, well, why is there a stigma? Well, if you're gonna be borrowing at an above market rate, presumably you don't wanna do that. Can you talk a little bit about why it, there was a period in which it was subsidized lending? What was, what was the purpose? Why have a special window for subsidized lending where maybe the borrowing is at a below market rate. Right. So so um generally throughout most of the Fed's history the the the, the discount rate was at or a bit above market rates. Okay. In the mid 1960s uh there was the Fed was under a lot of pressure from the Johnson administration and from Congress to not tighten monetary policy. Uh -huh. The Great Society was beginning, the Vietnam War was going on. They they didn't want the Fed to to choke that off by raising tightening monetary policy. But back then, but the Fed was very concerned about inflation. So they they were determined to tighten monetary policy. Huh. And uh, back then, what people paid attention to was the discount rate as the measure of of the stance of policy. So uh, in, the, in the second half of the 60s, uh, the Fed kept the discount rate constant, but they tightened reserve conditions and raised the federal funds rate like you would see now. So the federal funds rate went from generally being at or below the discount rate to being about 50 basis points above the discount rate hmm. as they tightened policy. And then it just stayed there for, for about 40 years. And it really wasn't until um, uh, Governor Lyle Gramlich uh, made a concerted effort to say that doesn't make sense. You want your lending rate to be, your to be above market rates so that it's a backstop uh, to overcome the sort of the cost of making the shift. That that there was a concerted effort then to to change the the way it was done. Hmm. So you talked about changes made over time to the discount window. Can you maybe talk about those through the frame of? why banks make the decision to use it? Like, what would be a bank's rationale for using it in, say, the 1960s versus maybe the early 2000s, 2008 versus, uh, I guess, now? So generally, the discount window, uh, discount lending. So this is, in fact, primary credit lending, which is what everyone calls discount rate, discount lending, uh, serves two purposes. So one purpose is a monetary policy function. The other purpose is a financial stability function. And so it made it, it was more important as a monetary policy tool back when the Fed was conducting policy the way it it did before the global financial crisis. So every day they would leave a certain amount of reserves out there uh, with the expectation that markets would clear at the rate that they were targeting. But some days they would leave too much and, it, and rates would fall to zero. Some day they would they might not leave enough. Rates would jump up, and the discount window was a tool for putting a ceiling. On, the, on those upward spikes. So the idea was, if rates rose up above the discount rate, why pay more in the Fed funds market when you could just turn to the discount uh, window and borrow at that rate? And it was a somewhat effective ceiling, but it Sorry, wasn't which perfect. Year, just, which years are we talking about again here? 
Honestly, I would say, you know, at least back to the 70s all okay. the way up to 2008. Okay, okay. But it wasn't the best ceiling because of stigma, which I'm, which we can come back to. The other function that the, that the discount... Uh, window serves is that it's a backup source of funding. It's a funding that you always know will be there. Banks pre-position collateral at the window. Banks have about a one and a half trillion dollars of collateral that just sits there at the window. It's mostly loans. Then the Fed applies a conservative haircut to it. And so that collateral is there. And if, the end, if at the end of the day you come up short, either because market conditions are tight for one reason or another, or there's some problem in the market, that, that collateral is there and you can borrow. And most importantly, because you know it's there, then you don't get the you you ideally don't get the pernicious dynamic that turns a liquidity strains into a liquidity crisis. So what happens when there's liquidity right. strains? Everybody gets worried about their liquidity situation. Uh, they don't want to come up short because that's really costly. So they pull back from lending to each other. They pull back from lending at term. But if you know that the discount rate window is there at the end of the day, you're less likely to do that. So both of those functions. Uh, have really been a, a function of, of its purpose all along, and they're they're all sort of stymied if no one's if people don't want to borrow. There's sort of a conceptual idea in monetary policy that asserts itself over and over again that we see, which is that the existence of some sort of entity, and it, it could be a window, it could be a borrowing facility, it could be a promise to cap yield somewhere, makes it so that in theory it does the entity doesn't have to be used. Right, and it feels like that is a recurring theme throughout monetary policy. Now, something, what is discount window eligible? What type of collateral? And is all, like, in a given bank's portfolio, like, is all, are all their assets discount eligible? Or how, what are the rules around that? The, the Fed's objective is that what, all bankable assets are eligible. Okay. And that, and th for which they can get a, uh, a good legal claim to. And what that mm. basically amounts to is performing loans, and investment grade securities, uh, and it, it's or and even some securities that are booked abroad. Although that takes some extra work to get the appropriate legal claim to the collateral. Banks tend to bring in their loans rather than their securities because the securities are useful sources of liquidity in other circumstances. But if they have a book of business loans that are just sitting there, uh, you know, then they can't get liquidity out of them. So they bring them into the Federal Reserve Bank, their Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank applies a lendable value to each of those loans. And that adds up to the to the stock of, of lendable value of collateral that, that each bank has at the Reserve Bank, ready to go if the bank needs it. It's also, that collateral is also used to collateralize daylight overdrafts. So one thing we haven't really spoken about or made explicit is uh, this is all done anonymously. So we don't know which bank is borrowing from the Fed. And one thing I've always wondered, I mean, presumably when you were supervising the discount window usage, you had some idea of who was using discount lending. Like, how does it actually work? Do you know who's using it and, and why at any given time? And, you know, are, are Fed officials sworn to secrecy or how does it work exactly? So you're right. The the, the secrecy, uh, keeping borrowers' identity secret is uh, it has always been seen as an important way to make borrowers willing to use the window. After all, and it is kind of a backup. So it is a backup source of funding in a lot of circumstances, and nobody wants the market to see that you're using your backup source of funding. So, so identifying borrowers, you know, has always been seen as a as a something that could contribute to stigma. After the global financial crisis. One of the reasons why stigma is is so bad now, it's as bad as it's ever been, is because hmm. during the global financial crisis, borrowing at the discount window kind of got lumped together with TARP capital injections yeah. and was seen as a as a bailout for the banks. But in fact, you know, again, most discount window lending is perfectly ordinary. It was provided at an above market rate, and all of the all of the discount window loans that were made by the Fed during the crisis, and also all their emergency loans were repaid on time with interest. So uh, they weren't a bailout, but they were seen that way. And that has made banks even more reluctant to, to use the window. But consequently, because the, you know, uh, the, the Fed agreed, or well, Congress instructed 
instructed the Fed to start identifying borrowers with a two-year lag. So now you can go in, you can look on the Fed's website and see oh. who borrowed two years ago. So, 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 okay, so fast forward to today, we have seen this little uptick. We will know in two years who these banks are? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so I, I don't really find the uptick to yeah. be necessarily that extraordinary. Sure, sure. So because banks are meant to view the window as something that they can use and 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 it's well, normal. So why don't you give an example in, in not identifying banks, because I don't know, you wouldn't know, um, but what would be the type of circumstances that today in 2023, mm -hmm. a bank might see fit to pay this slightly above market uh, rate to get liquidity for their collateral? So when we designed the, the the current discount window arrangement yeah. in 2003, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking, well, what's the right rate that we need to charge to make the rate alone uh, something that will encourage banks to just use it as a backstop? But we had to pick one rate for all 30,000 DIs, including every tiny credit union, and 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 that that's that's a quite a wide range of alternative source of funding costs, and so. Uh, but you can't charge smaller banks more than larger banks. That's actually that's going to be that would be impossible. Okay. So right now, uh, the discount rate is is at the top end of the of the target range. It's a much lower relative to the Fed funds rate than it has than it was when we designed it this way. Okay. And so it's about fifteen to eighteen basis points. So when you when you look at the the gamut of smaller institutions, there's a lot of them. Uh, where that's not such an unattractive rate. They might come in and borrow from the window for a while. Maybe they lost a municipal deposit and need funding for a little while. Or actually, it's so close to the Fed funds rate that under some circumstances, Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, it's, it's, it's less expensive than certain types of Federal Home Loan Bank borrowing. So there's pr pretty good reason to, to think that there's just uh, a lot of smaller institutions are finding the rate relatively attractive. One of the things that was noticeable is that the rate, that the borrowing went up quite a bit at, in advance of each FOMC meeting. Hmm. So there seemed to be some kind of a dynamic between the, the expected rate jumping up and the relative attractiveness of the discount rate. Haven't really completely figured that out. <laughs> Maybe they're just trying to uh, maybe they're trying to give the Fed what it wants. You know, they're saying like, "Look, we're using the discount window. Look at us before your meeting every time." Well, <laughs> it could. Well, in some sense, you could be right. It becomes especially Im important for the Fed that everybody sees the discount window as a viable source of short-term funding when the Fed is shrinking, when they're reducing the size uh -huh. of the balance sheet, and so. I'm not aware of any direct communication to this effect, but it would be sensible that they would be out there saying, because as, as you guys know, yeah. as the Fed shrinks its assets, it's also shrinking its liabilities, including in particular mm -hmm. reserve balances, the deposits of banks at the window. So for the Fed to get as small as it wants to be, banks have to m reduce their demand for those deposits at the Fed. And one way to do that is make them comfortable with the idea that, well, if you really need money at the end of the day and you happen to un, you know, surprisingly come up short, you can always use the discount window. It's kind of like if you have a checking account that has overdraft protection versus one that doesn't. You're probably going to be happy running a lower balance uh, with, on the one with the overdraft protection. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, if, if using that overdraft protection hurts your credit rating, then you, then you won't be willing to do it. And that's where the problem mm. of stigma comes in. Stigma is kind of like, well, there's sort of an implicit pe penalty out there, maybe on the part of examiners, maybe on the part of management uh, that impose the cost of using it. So that's so do if you, you can reduce that stigma, then you can get banks to be happy to hold smaller levels of reserve balances and the Fed can, can continue QT longer than it would be able to otherwise. Do banks actually sort of talk behind each other's backs, I guess, for, for lack of a better expression, about who they think might be using the discount window? Like, is the stigma that strong in the sense that maybe, you know, if you think someone's in trouble and they're using it, you might be reticent to to deal with them or extend financing to them? Is there like a real world cost of that kind of speculation? Uh, there can be. I really don't think that the lending that's going on now is 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 meaningful enough. But if you go back, say, before the global financial crisis and before this change, one of the rules that the Fed had when it was extending credit at a subsidy rate was you have to go out there and try to get the money at a market rate before you come to us. So mm -hmm. if somebody was out in the market bidding for funds and then they didn't end the day actually getting those funds in the marketplace, people would speculate, well, they went to the discount window. And that would be something that 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 market participants would be concerned about. But it's gen but it is speculation. It's not made public. What is the job of the discount 
window manager entail? Accept collateral, value collateral, and extend the credit when the when the credit but is. But like on a day to day business, I mean, you 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 did you ran it for ten years. Like, what is it like on a day to day business uh, or on a day to day basis? What does it look like in that role? So I was at the board. So my job was sort of designing policy, so making sure the policies okay, okay. were followed at the reserve banks. Uh, but you know, so at each yeah. reserve bank, there's a discount officer, and they may, they you know, they would be, it would, they would determine how much seasonal credit a bank could get for, based yeah. on their seasonal needs. They would determine whether a bank was eligible for primary credit because to be to get primary credit, you have to be financially sound. Otherwise, you get secondary credit, and they would manage the provision the, the extension of credit and the collateral make sure the fed has the right legal claim to the collateral so that somebody else doesn't come and get it and then managing requests so you touched on this briefly already but i i think it's important so I, i'd love to hear more can you sort of place the discount window in the in the ecosystem or constellation of borrowing facilities available to banks right now because as we've been discussing these things have changed over time and nowadays you have a whole bunch of alternatives, even more than we had post-2008 financial crisis. You have things like the standing repo facility, the reverse repo facility. How does the discount window fit in with all these other things? Coming from the Fed, there's two relevant facilities. So there's primary credit, the discount window, and then there's the standing repo facility, which was created a couple of years ago yeah. by, by the Fed. And the standing repo facility uh, is actually, what, what the standing repo facility does is it only accepts Treasuries and agency MBS is collateral, what's called open market operations collateral, OMO collateral. And each day it stands ready to conduct repos with the banks that are that are a participant at the facility at the SRF rate or the discount rate against those securities. So really it's it looks a lot like a discount window loan. It's a collateralized loan at the discount rate. There's a few things that are different. Because it's authorized under the Fed's open market legal authority. It's not limited to commercial banks. And in particular, primary dealers, the broker dealers that do business with the Fed regularly, they're automatically eligible for the standing repo facility. And then other banks have signed up, but banks have been relatively slow to sign up for a couple reasons. But uh, right now, only large banks, GSIBs, and some U.S. branches of, of uh, foreign banks are signed up. The, the standing repo facility was designed for two reasons. One was just to provide participants in the repo market a backstop. And, and it was kind of targeted towards the repo volatility that took place in September 2019. So they wanted right. they wanted banks uh, and, and broker dealers to know that if they extend credit when markets are tight, that that if push comes to shove, they can always get funding at the end of the day at the standing repo facility. But the other objective uh, was to create something that basically served the same function as the discount window, but didn't have the same look and feel of the, as the discount window. It, it was extended under discount, different authority. It was a repo, not a loan. It was meant to, because open market operations, there's no stigma associated with open market operations. Yeah. So they were trying to to get some of that positive energy from the, from the open market operations. And so far, it's not completely clear that it's actually working. But I guess it's like one of those things where, okay, the the facility exists, even if there's not that much uptake or sign up. So in theoretically, that might still have some stabilizing effect, knowing that there could be more usage of it. It could, but you have to sign up and that takes right. some time. Oh, but it works for primary dealers, for example. I want to go back to something you said. You said the spread, the current discount window rate is fairly narrow right yes. now. Can you uh, remind again, like how is that set, that number? So th so that's actually more complicated than you would think that oh, it would okay. be. So, uh, each, so the discount rate is set by the reserve banks with the advice and determination of the board. Okay. And so if you ask somebody on the board, they'd say the board sets the discount rate. Huh. And if you ask people at the reserve banks, they'd say the reserve banks set the discount rate. And in, and actually there's 12 discount rates, one for each reserve bank. Oh. But what happens is that each um, board of directors of each reserve bank quests a discount rate 
And then that sits there at the board. And when the FOMC changes the target for the federal funds rate, they accept whatever requests are sitting there that conform with the change in the target for the federal funds rate. Huh. And the other reserve banks scramble to get in conforming requests. And so maybe over the next day or even that afternoon, the other requests come in. But actually looking at discount window minutes, which are published by the Fed, can be an interesting way to, to learn about dissent on the part of the reserve banks about what the FOMC did that otherwise you wouldn't know about. Because huh. if the reserve banks have requested a 75 basis point increase and the FOMC just increases 50 basis points, you'll never know that unless you actually read the minutes and you, you I don't think I've otherwise. ever, I didn't even know there were discount window minutes. There, there are. Huh. <laughs> you gotta start reading those. <laughs> Some light bedtime reading for you, Joe. So maybe just to sum it all up, you know, we're seeing discount window usage go up. Would you expect that discount lending to continue increasing going forward, given that the Fed is ostensibly shrinking its balance sheet and tightening monetary policy? And then secondly, I, I guess this is the thing I, I, I don't really get because you describe discount lending as maybe it's uh, Maybe the rate makes sense, particularly for some smaller banks, given all these moving parts in monetary policy right now. But at the same time, reserves are still pretty ample. I can't remember if the Fed had like a particular level in mind, but I think we just dipped below like three trillion and probably closer to two trillion might be the, the threshold for ample. But it would seem like there's enough liquidity out there such that banks don't need to use the discount window. And yet that is exactly what we're seeing. So I think that, you know, we're all used to thinking about a banks in, in terms of the big banks. Those are the ones that we're used to thinking about their activity in money markets. But again, there really, there's, you know, there's thousands of banks out there of all sizes. And so in an environment when deposits are running off, loan growth is strong, uh, the discount rate is very close to uh, the target for federal funds rate to money market rates. It, it isn't surprising to me that there are a lot of smaller banks out there coming in and using the window. Uh, and it could have been that that troubles in the fintech industry contributed to some uptick in borrowing uh, over the recent months. Uh, and you've noticed, and as, as you mentioned, you know that borrowing has has come down. I, I mm -hmm. would expect the borrowing to continue at a modest level uh, going forward. It's actually. Pretty interesting that the the, uh, the the Bank of England has actually used is actually is going plans on using that as their way to figure out how small they can get. So it's it's quite different. So the Fed's policy is we're going to shrink. We don't know how small we can get, but we're going to shrink until we're about three hundred billion dollars above that level. So that's kind of a tricky act to <laughs> to execute. Uh, what the Bank of England has done is they've said we're going to make our lending rate and our borrowing rate equal, and we 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 also opened a new standing repo facility. Unlike the Fed, we've advertised that we want people to use it. We've gone out to our examiners and told them that it's okay to use it. And what we plan on doing is we plan on shrinking until we see borrowing at that facility pick up. Uh, and then not only will that mean that they'll really know how small they can get, but it will create a positive dynamic that will get them smaller because market rates will be a bit above the rate that, that the uh, the Bank of England pays on the reserves. And that will give banks and bank examiners incentive to get used to banks getting smaller and smaller in the usage of reserves. The Fed's plan has the reverse effect. We're going to stop with a lot of extra reserves out there, the market rates will remain below the rate that we pay on reserve balances because there's an abundance of reserve balances out there. That will never create that incentive for banks to economize on reserve balances. So it doesn't really create that same hmm. incentive for the central bank to get smaller over time. Just one last question from me, and I guess I'm just still trying to wrap my head around this. And you know, and uh, Tracy asked, well, like, why would anyone use it? And you mentioned. Uh, it's probably the smaller banks. What is the what is the circumstances of some of these tiny banks? And you mentioned maybe not even the fintech that would push them not and as, as opposed to the big banks into having some impulse to use this. So they use it because they they need funding for okay. some reason or another. And in some circumstances, it's actually less expensive funding than the federal home loan banks, which is a which banks oh, borrow okay. a lot from the federal home loan banks. It's sort of a very normal normal okay. thing. They're widely used as sort of the contingent backup source of funding or regular source of funding. And with the Fed raising rates so so rapidly mm -hmm. and with the rates so close, there's actually, it actually, in some circumstances, can be more attractive. But also, 
I, I, for a few basis points here and there, yeah. that really doesn't necessarily determine these de the decisions. So if it's convenient to use the discount window, um, the Sorry, smaller banks will use like it. What does mean like convenient? Because I know there's not like actual window. I assume it's all just like mouse clicks, <laughs> right? Like what that's does right. that actually mean? Like when we were talking about convenience and that's, and you're just like, okay, like the collateral's right there at the window ready to be used. Like what are we actually talking about when we talk about convenience? So you just call up your discount officer. Or okay. The discount window is open until the very end of the day. It's okay. open past anything else. Fedwire closes, oh. you can still get a discount window. Long what time does while. Fedwire close? I don't, I don't okay, remember anymore. Enough. I used to know that, but it's That's been too long since I've been gone from the Fed. And so you can always get it there. Your collateral is there. It's just, you know, you, you just call up and request it. It used to be that loans were extended just on an overnight basis, so you'd have to roll them. Yeah. But starting in the global financial crisis, and as a, as a means to encourage banks to use the window, they extended the, origin, the initial maturity to 90 days. Oh, okay. Renewable on your request, so you could always so keep it out there. So it really is easy. It really is easy, and hmm. they never changed it back from 90 days to overnight. Okay. So, um, I like uh, the uh, the idea of the discount window as like the Taco Bell of liquidity yeah. facilities. <laughs> it's it's open at all hours, but you might feel it's bad. It's like why like, would yeah. you? You know <laughs> exactly. There's but a, too much Taco Bell is yeah, still probably not the way. To right. Go. So it's like, well, why? You know, I was like down in Texas recently, and there's it's like, why would you eat a Taco Bell when there's Tex-Mex? Like, well, it's you know, it's open, it's there, right. it's around. Right. The you corner. know, you know what you're getting. Yeah, you know, you know exactly what, you're getting. what you're getting. Okay. I, yeah. I'm sort of I'm sort of getting it. So I, <laughs> maybe there's a little stigma attached to eat, you know eating a Taco Bell when you're in Texas, but I guess you know. So there's actually right now more stigma than there has ever been. Yeah. Let me give, let give you a few uh, okay. a anecdotes on why that is. So uh, Betsy Duke was the uh, was a governor of the Federal Reserve System. She had been a CEO at a regional bank before that, and she and this so go go back before the global financial crisis. She described borrowing from the discount window as like borrowing money from your parents. You'll do it if you have to, but nobody really wants to, and you yeah. feel kind of bad about it. Now, after the global financial crisis, with all of this, uh, you know, sort of recriminations about receiving a bailout and public flogging of the people that use yeah. the window, and bank management really not wanting to go through that again, uh, the the stigma just jumped exponentially. Right. And I was told by uh, a treasurer at at the U.S. branch of a of a foreign bank that when he got his job, he was told, well, if you ever do borrow from the discount window, there's going to be two phone calls. There's going to be a phone call from the president of the New York Fed to our CEO to ask why you borrowed. Huh. And there's going to be a phone call from human resources to you to tell you to clean out your desk. <laughs> So, okay. you know, under those circumstances, yeah, wow. right? And so, I mean, w one of the issues that that complicates stigma is that you get a very different message. I've, I'm told this from by, by the bankers that I work with, from the discount officers and from the supervisors. So the discount officers kind of understand, they encourage you to want to use it. Supervisors, on the other hand, really are uncomfortable with using the discount window. And, and in the end, this is the complication of having something that you want people to use, but it's still supposed to be a backup. Yeah. When you when you tap your backup, it kind of says something went wrong. And when we when we designed the new discount window and it was no questions asked, I was talking to a bank out on the West Coast and encouraging them you know, to use the window. And they said, our supervisor really doesn't want us to use the window. And I said, oh, we'll tell them about these changes that we've made. And they said, no, we told them about it. And they still don't want us to use it. So I went back to DC and I got all, and, and working with all the banking agencies, got the banking agencies to write what's called an SR letter. And this is still the rule of, this is still the law of the land. It's a letter to the banking, to the bank examiners that says it's okay to use the discount window. So I went back to the bank, Swesscomp Bank. They said, yeah, we got our, our examiner to read the SR letter, but they still don't think it's a good idea to use the discount window. <laughs> so, so that kind of so entrenched, it, yeah, it, it can so. be hard to overcome. Yeah. Uh, well, Bill, I am so glad uh, we were able to have this conversation. That was really a, a fantastic uh, overview of the discount window. And you really put it in, in context for us as well, the recent discount lending. So thank you so much for coming on Oddbots. You bet. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that was, I learned a lot. Thanks, Bill. So, Joe, I, th I thought that was really interesting and really 
great to um, to hear about the discount window from someone, you know, who has that operational experience with it and who has been thinking about what it's there for for a long time. And also, I thought it was really interesting to hear about the changes from, you know, 1960s to today. And and in some ways, this idea that we're sort of going back to, to the 1960s, where it's more about maybe adjusting to monetary policy than actual emergency lending, like we saw in 2008. It is interesting, you know, and thinking back to some of these recent episodes that we've done with like uh, Josh Younger and so forth, like the degree to which some of these conflicts between uh, one entity Mm -hmm. that wants tighter monetary policy, fight inflation versus other entities, political entities that don't um, is super interesting. I thought the comparison to sort of like overdraft protection was very yeah. helpful in understanding it. And this idea that like, if, you know, no one really wants to like overdraft, but if you know that that protection is there, then you might be comfortable like holding lower balances and so forth. That I think really helped me sort of wrap my head around like what this facility is really for. It is still the case though, that we could be seeing some banks experiencing some liquidity strains, not out of the realms of possibility. And certainly we know that a lot of smaller banks, you know, probably have mark to market losses on their portfolios of bonds, um, you know, treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. And I think I think the FHLBs are required to use tangible equity, um, which includes unrealized gains and losses. So on, on I'm going to get this wrong, unavailable for sales securities, I think. So it would mean if, if you had marked down your bond portfolio quite a lot, you might be locked out of that borrowing, and then that might lead you to go to the discount window. But but overall... Well, we'll find out well, in two I, years. I was going to say, I guess the new, the good news is we only have to wait two years because thanks to Dodd-Frank, we'll find out who's been using the discount window in, uh, what is it? It's 2023. In 2025. And then for all the stigma, they're like, yeah, it was two years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> They'll be like, we did what we were supposed to do. Well, we'll have to have Bill on. Yeah. When we, uh, when we, when we, we we'll go report. over, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say what was going on with them. We'll officially solve the mystery of discount lending in 2022 and 2023. All right. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Arman and Dash Bennett at Dashbot. And check out all of the podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at podcasts and... For more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we post transcripts, Tracy and I blog, and we have a weekly newsletter that comes out every Friday. Go there, subscribe to it, get it in your inbox. Thanks for listening.